And the press was not good to us. I think the press has been twice as bad during this farm bill to agriculture than anything I've ever seen. But it's a daily barrage. Uh, I think I could pull you, without exaggeration, a negative article like these uh, in major daily newspapers at least every three days for the last year and a half. Uh, the longer we take to get this farm bill, I sort of shudder when people say extension, because the longer we take, the more negativity it gets in the paper. Um, it is never a positive story about farmers and ranchers. It's all, why are we spending way, way too much <clears throat> money on uh, farmers and ranchers that are already doing better than their city brethren? Um, so we are struggling with that. Um, you know, I put this paper up here. If, you, if, you, if you're in soybeans, you may know Ray Gasser from Iowa. He's about to be the president of the American Soybean Association. He's a good friend of mine. But I would tell you that, <clears throat> you know, we all have to think a bit more about farmers. Uh, the Wall Street Journal called Ray and said, we'd like to bring a reporter and a photographer from Chicago out to your farm. What do you think? And he said, okay. And so they get out there and you can see they lined up all his pictures and he says, I bought four new tractors, a new combine, two planting units and crop sprayer for this season. And by the way, next year I'm gonna trade them all in. Just not exactly what we wanted to see on the front of the Wall Street Journal. Really happy for Gasser, but it was like, I just know someday I'm gonna turn on my TV on the center of the house floor and there's gonna be a big old picture of Ray Gasser and they're gonna be saying, why in the world are we helping farmers if they're out buying combines that are hundreds of thousands of dollars? So not only have we sort of let the press get to us, but we also um, have helped feed them into that. And I think we have to think a little more clearly about you know, what it is that we're really trying to say uh, in the thing. What, what Ray was really trying to say is I want the, uh, the depreciation write-offs for equipment and it's going to be a problem if I don't get it. But what he got was, uh, and there was actually a second picture of the tractors rearranged and Ray in another place and Ray's a smiley guy so he always has that smile on his face. But um, not exactly the publicity we want. So I think we have to think about what we're doing there. One of the other things that is not totally new, but sure is a lot more this year, is a lot more groups involved in agriculture than we've ever seen before. I think the Heritage Foundation leads that. I think the Environmental Working Group has done really well feeding the Heritage Foundation and the R Street folks and uh, the Taxpayers for Common Sense information, but we've had really negative hits from all of these folks, and they continue to really go at it. So. Um, you know, they have even, even gone out with ads where they've attacked people like uh, Chairman Frank Lucas uh, on radio ads <clears throat> saying, you know, you really, shouldn't, um, you really shouldn't do this farm bill, et cetera, and this is the kind of person that we don't need to have in Congress, et cetera. Um, so not a good thing. Now, when we think about the farm bill, <clears throat> I think there are still two really huge issues that we as an organization uh, are trying to work out in the farm bill. Uh, one of them is to make sure that the House proposal to repeal the permanent laws of 1938 and 1949 uh, don't get repealed. Uh, their idea is, hey, why would we have these old laws that we no longer can defend, uh, and especially to our urban members, <clears throat> let's get rid of them and let's replace the 38 and the 49 Act with the commodity title only of the 2013 Farm Bill. And um, our retort is that, you know, really when we write a farm bill, how this permanent law works is every five years when we write a farm bill, we put a little provision in there that says if we don't finish this farm bill by September 30th of five years from now, then the permanent law of 38 and 49 kicks in. Well, it's an administrative nightmare to figure out how to implement the 38 or the 49 Act. I'm really not sure all the smart people at USDA could ever do it. Um, it's based on parity prices of what you had at that point in time. It's based on your base acres. Uh, and by the way, the furthest back that USDA has bakers, uh, base acres reported them is 1971. So I wonder how many farmers in this room could prove that they had base acres on their farm in 1949. Not very many. So I don't know exactly how they do it. One of the other real problems with it is that you have, for example, you have a support price for corn. But in 1949, there was no support price for soybeans. So corn farmers would be helped in a pretty big way, as would rice farmers, as would uh, wheat folks. Uh, soybean folks are out the, out the side. So is sugar, et cetera. There were no programs, so a very inequitable program. Um, but even more important than that, I think, is that if you replace them with only that act, and obviously if you had been doing this commodity title, implementing it at USDA for five years, <clears throat> not very hard to implement it for the next five years if you don't get a farm bill done. 
pretty darn easy. We don't really have that 38 and that 49 Act there because we ever want it to go in place. We don't want the increase in milk prices that will happen if we don't get this farm bill done. But what we want is the big sledgehammer that makes Congress act. And I think you really only have to look back to December 31st, 2012, when we passed the farm bill right before or after uh, the New Year's Eve clock uh, struck to see that had we not had that, we would have had a real issue. <clears throat> um, but there is no hammer for conservation programs. So if you use EQIP to build buffer zones along your creeks or uh, to build fences, if you participate in a rural development program, if you are a specialty crop producer, if you like some of the energy programs, they're all gone. Nobody has to worry about them at all. So this would really only help a certain portion of commodity growers. But for everybody else who doesn't use that commodity program, uh, we're going to be in a world of hurt. So again, we feel really strongly that repealing permanent law is a bad way to go. It probably won't affect whether we get this farm bill done, but it'll make it really, really hard to get the next farm bill done. So that's one of the, uh, one of the two issues. Um, you can see the Heritage Foundation back in September was already talking about, hey, you know, let's go, let's have an extension. Uh, they don't want an extension because they want to continue direct payments. They want an extension because they say, give members of Congress the time to identify the best ways to keep food stamps and farm programs separated. That's the second big issue that we think is big. And I never come to a meeting, never, ever, ever, but what somebody stands up when I'm done and says, why don't we get rid of food stamps and take it out of the farm bill so people don't think all that money is being spent on us? Um, the answer is, we never pass another farm bill. And that's exactly what the Heritage Foundation wants. Um, they know that if we have food stamp advocates and farm advocates together, we got a pretty good chance of withstanding massive, massive cuts. But if they split us into two groups, they'll do much better at being able to get it done. Again, it probably would not affect the ability to get this farm bill done, but since the House, 25% of those 435 members have zero farmers in their district. They're the LA's, the Phoenix's, the New York cities. Uh, they don't like us well enough to vote on us. We would never get another farm bill through the House of Representatives if we didn't have food stamps included. So again, a really critical point as far as we move forward. Now, you know, when we put the food stamps together, it was actually in the 80s, so you look there kind of at the middle graph and you can see there wasn't that much difference between what farm programs and nutrition cost at that point in time. And people, and Bob Dole was one of them, and George McGovern was another, they were smart enough to see that as time went on, what was going to happen is we were going to get more people on food stamps and fewer that were part uh, participating in farm programs, and that, you know, things were going to change and we needed food stamp people just as much as they needed us. So they married two together. Now, do I think either one of them ever thought we'd get to the point where we are in 2010 and get that huge uh, increase in food stamps? Probably not. But um, it is a really ind good indication of why they indeed decided to marry those two programs. Here's where we are in food stamp participation. I think no surprise, but one out of every seven people in this country. And the amount of money that we spent on food stamp doubled since Obama took office. Doubled. Participation didn't double, but the amount of money that it cost us to do it has doubled. So um, that's why I think you get so many people looking at this issue and saying, how can we afford it? Uh, there's the chart that everybody probably knows by heart right now, but you've got somewhere in the range of about 80% of the funding in the Farm Bill that is for nutrition programs. It's primarily the food stamp program. Then you get about 9% that's for crop insurance, about 6% for commodities, 7 for uh, conservation, and, you know, the little bits for everything else hardly make up a blip in the chart. So the vast majority of it is indeed food stamp program.